how fast technology has been evolving lately. But what we may not be as well aware of is how much faster hacking and malware have been evolving along with that. And you may ask a legitimate question, which is, why do I care? Right? I have my antivirus, which is up to date. I have the latest update. But do you know that according to the latest hacking events, that your computer could very well be hacked just by you visiting a fairly legitimate, reputable website? Um, also, did you know that your Uncle Tommy, whom you love dearly, who wears a pacemaker, could be killed by a jolt, a high voltage jolt by a hacker sitting 50 feet away from them. These are realities. These are realities that we're waking up to and they're kind of eye openers to us. So what I wanna do is I wanna take you on kind of a roller coaster ride of um, discussing the latest evolutions of technology on the positive side, what we have accomplished so far, as well as the negative side. Unfortunately, we have to address that at some point. So I'm gonna get into a reflection and then come out at the end at the finish line of that roller coaster with a proposition for you to think about. But being a, uh, an academic, as one of my um, wise colleagues once said, that we academians put people to sleep for free. And uh, <laughs> I probably chose the, I had a poor choice of slots in the afternoon after everybody ate. Um, um, well, engineering, I want you to pay attention to the circled areas and the um, definition. So basically for engineering, we're trying to manufacture, we're trying to design a product. And this product could be anything or anybody for that fact, as we will see. And also, the second circled part, which is we're trying to affect behavior. And that's really the, the context in which I want to approach the term engineering. Also, hack or hacking. Basically, to hack is to come up with a creative solution. This is the original meaning of the word hack. Obviously, it has carried a negative connotation lately, and for good reasons. Um, but this could be on the good side as well as on the bad side. So again, going in, into a reflection of the latest state of technology, we're far beyond that cliche statement that states that technology is advancing at a fast pace. We all know that, right? And one of the measures of how much we're advancing, one of the standard conventional methods is referred to as Moore's Law, which, is, which was coined by Gordon Moore, who is the co-founder of Intel in the 60s. And basically what it states is that the processor power will keep doubling every couple of years almost. Well, great, we feel good about that. You got this linear relationship that is going on there. But if we compare that to the exponential growth of malware between 2007 and 2010, according to Panda Security, malware has gone up. And this is unique breeds of malware from 6 million to 60 million. Reads. This is exponential, right? Also add to that the fact that mobile malware is becoming common nowadays. Now, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I have a tool on my uh, phone, a very legitimate one, and I could see that we have a nice ratio of iPhones to uh, Samsung devices in this room. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I had to share that with you. Um, very legal tool, though. Um, but what? <laughs> it is legal. Uh, <laughs> uh, but let's look at Facebook, for example. 1.06 billion users, unique users, on a monthly basis using this social network on cyberspace. Regardless of what we think of Facebook, okay? Some people cannot stand Facebook. They think it's a privacy, privacy disaster. But regardless of that, it's an accomplishment in terms of technology. New York Times, 
has garnered up to 50 million unique visitors. Again, it's an accomplishment. Compare that to the fact that lately, incidents, hacking incidents, have really affected big companies like New York Times, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft. So it's no longer the case that it's only small companies that are not equipped with sufficient and adequate defenses that are being hacked. It's the big companies out there. NBC.com, number one out there broadcasting, blah, blah, blah. We love that. It's, it's a really nice uh, presence on the internet. NBC.com is the one I referred to earlier being uh, infected at some time, and it caused drive-by infections to its visitors. So all you had to do is visit NBC.com, and your computer will be infected. This is a new turf. Now, another new era that we're delving into is wearable computing. So, for example, my shirt will tell me that it needs to be washed by 6 p.m. tomorrow. This is great, great for our lifestyle. But also, medical devices like Pacemaker have also been added to the wireless network. And this is great because it provides the doctors with the capability to download and upload data readily. But guess who else finds that as a good opportunity to upload and download malware to, to the Pacemaker? And it has been proven. A researcher has proven practically and demonstrated that they could issue a 800, up to 830 volt jolt, a deadly one, to someone with a pacemaker by sitting almost up to 50 feet away from them. Again, it's the new turf that we're talking about. Also, we're delving into a new era of the Internet of Things. And basically what this is, is that we as human beings, along with any device that we interact with, appliances that we have, our dogs, our animals, will all be meshed together in a global network so I can tell my oven to continue baking for my daughter's bake sale from across the globe. I mean, this is great accomplishment. However, having witnessed the rise of the smart, I mean, an earlier speech talked about smartphones, but we, we're not only dealing with smartphones, we have smart cars, smart fridges, smart grids, Everything is turning smart, I guess, except humans. <laughs> Someone may argue there is an inversely proportional relationship there. <laughs> so the question that begs itself is, we must be ready, right? Well, sorry, we're not. Uh, nine out of ten schools in the U.S. do not teach programming. Not only that. 41 out of 50 states do not count coding classes towards a high school graduation. How are we going to encourage the next generation to fill that gap while you see that at the top of the echelon of those hot jobs out there is a systems engineer, which requires a tremendous amount of technological savviness, or to some extent at least. So this gap is widening according to research, and it's posted on code.org. You can research everything that I've posted in there. I've, I've done a, a lot of research and I included all the references. This gap will get, it's projected to get, by 2020, up to one million unfilled jobs, technical jobs. Why is that? Because what we're doing is we're trying to equip only 2% of our next generation of the students while we have 60% availability out of the STEM jobs. Now, I want to also bring up an article that I read on nextgov.com, and basically one statement that I saw in there, which states that 80%, up to 80% of STEM students in universities have chosen their field when they were in high school, even some in middle school. When I saw that, bingo. And that's really the audience that we need to address. That's the audience that we need to target by educating them. So having seen all of that, I started self-reflection and I started reflecting on what I've done <laughs> and started connecting the heads. <laughs> uh, I've done cloud computing. Why is that? Because everything is a cloud. There's an iCloud, your cloud, my cloud. We're all in the cloud nowadays. 
have done data mining research really because we're blasted by exabytes and exabytes of data on a, on a daily basis. And it's not stopping, it's getting even worse. So we have to make some sense out of that data. I, I also have done malware analysis and reverse engineering. And for good reasons. The good reason is because I, you know, I included the statistics uh, listed earlier, and we're blasted with all sorts of malware uh, nowadays. And then I projected that. I also developed apps on the App Store mostly. And, and basically, it's, it's because everything is turning into an app. And I reflected on that, all of that, and I started relating it to my current role as a university professor. And I applied for grants with NSF to try to educate the next generation. And I'll be honest with you, a couple of weeks ago marks the sixth rejection that I got from NSF for grant submissions. Now, I'm not giving up on that, and I really don't want anybody to, to give up. What I'm trying to do is to convey a message to you so you carry it and spread that word, because this needs to come from all across the board. We need to have a collaborative effort to address this. And then I ran into this, Raspberry Pi. I don't know if any of you have seen the Raspberry Pi. Uh, Raspberry Pi is a credit card sized computer that was created for that purpose, for basically to educate kids about computing. And when I saw that, this was my <laughs> feeling. <laughs> now, my wife did not share that feeling. <laughs> and it was mostly because I went crazy with this. I, I went ahead and I stayed till like 4 a.m. starting to work on various projects with the Raspberry Pi, opened my garage through Siri with that, and you know, various different types of projects. And then I formed this meetup group. We met for the first time, we had the kickoff meeting in February, and then we had the second meeting just last night on Pi Day. You know, Pi... <laughs> I'm not that good with puns, you know. <laughs> um, but, but this tool comes equipped with quite a few things that allow a five-year-old, like Megan, to create her own program. She created a small program that allowed her to navigate a cartoon character around the screen. This is great. I mean, this is an accomplishment. This is the kind of thing that we need to do in order for us to attract kids to computing. So you may ask, what is my proposition? It is basically to create a next generation. This is the engineering part. We need to engineer, we need to manufacture, we need to impact the behavior of the next generation, K through 12, mostly and have them engage in this technological advancement and eventually have them fill that gap. Try to engage them in, in, in practical experiential learning that would be much more productive. Now, I, there are several silos that I've noticed that have come up lately. One of them is Code.org, which is supported uh, by Microsoft and, and Facebook, who were both hacked lately. Uh, <laughs> um, and then raspberrypi.org that, that I mentioned earlier. And then Stay Safe Online is a collaborative effort between the DHS and, and other um, industry uh, players and so forth. And I also attended an event uh, called MHACS. I don't know if anybody here has attended it, but MHACS is, is basically a, an event that gathers uh, college students and it was organized by you know the university with a big M down the... <laughs> um, University of Michigan had this, and, and I really felt that this is a great accomplishment. And I saw a lot of college students hacking apps in a good way, and then creating all sorts of solutions. I think we need to transition that into our K through 12. We need to create something like hack to the top. You're probably familiar with the race to the top. What I mean by that, regardless of the pros and cons of the actual race to the top, I think this needs to be sponsored at various levels. I want to leave you with one last thing. We are no longer in an era where technology is used as an auxiliary tool. Technology is becoming an integral part of our lives, and it's meshed within our lives. Just imagine a time when we are so dependent on this technology and it's become so dispensable that someone would pull the plug on it. A hacker would just pull the plug on it. Are we ready for that? Are we making our next generation ready for this? This is a serious plea that I would like to leave you with. Think about it. Thank you.